For more media content from Grace Community Church in San Antonio, Texas, go to gccsatx.com. Media used by permission of Heart Cry Missionary Society. Visit us online at heartcrymissionary.com. My mother was converted when she was about 12 years old uh, from a Croatian family. Her parents had come through Ellis Island. My grandmother on my mother's side was oftentimes uh, persecuted for her faith because uh, being Croatian uh, and Catholic are almost synonymous. You're almost a traitor if, if, you, if you leave Catholicism. Plus, the only evangelical church she could go to was Serbian. And the Catholics and the Serbians are constantly at war. So for my grandmother to leave Catholicism and then fellowship with Serbians was oftentimes very looked down upon. Uh, she suffered. My mother was over at, a, over at her girlfriend's house when she was 12 years old and they happened to be Baptist. And she was playing with dolls up on the uh, second floor. And the family was gathered around the piano and started singing hymns. And my mother said she heard the hymns, but all of a sudden such a great remorse and weeping of sin and came over her that she started weeping so hysterically that they stopped playing the piano. They ran upstairs thinking she was injured. They shared the gospel with her with regard to her sin and she was converted. Um, now my mother uh, eventually uh, married my father and... Um, his, both his parents, uh, my grandparents, were some of the first missionaries, Baptist missionaries, to Brazil in Manaus back in, I think, the 20s and 30s. Um, but my, grand, my father was never converted uh, that I know of. Uh, when I was 17, uh, we were out uh, building a fence, and he yelled, and I grabbed him, and um, we fell to the ground, and, and he was dead. Uh, I had never known him to profess faith in Christ. Um, at that point, I was, it was basketball, basketball season was beginning and such, and I um, was one of the captains on the team, and I was the uh, president of the Beta Club or Honor Society. Within just a few months, I digressed to getting finally kicked off the team and kicked out of the Honor Society, and I drank a lot. And um, people said that the the trauma of my father's death led to all that when in fact that's what I said uh, when in fact what I soon come to understand after I was a Christian was that my father's death gave my flesh a wonderful opportunity to do everything it had ever wanted to do um, it just manifested what I really was I was a, a, a liar the best. I mean, I don't know how to describe me except look up jerk in the dictionary and had my picture there. A conceited, self-absorbed jerk. And I went to Murray State University for a few years and then decided that I wanted to be an oil and gas warrior. Wherever that idea popped into my head, I don't know. Maybe it's because of the program Dallas or something. And the only place to do that was either Oklahoma or Texas. And I enrolled at the University of Texas. And while I was there, I, I thought to myself, I can change my life. Not be such a jerk. Not be so self-absorbed. Not be such a liar. And um, nothing changed. Within a few months, I found myself right back into the same place I'd always been. And um, I noticed I moved into a place called Plaza 25 there at the University of Texas. And I noticed there was a group of guys there that just seemed different. Just seemed very different. After a while, I came to understand they were Christians and they would have Bible studies and things like that. And I didn't pay much attention to them. And then one night um, in February, after I'd spent a semester there and just messed up my life altogether, um, I was sitting on the edge of my bed. It was like one in the morning. And um, I was on steroids really heavy. I, I lifted weights all the time. Uh, I wasn't any good at it, but I lifted weights all the time. And uh, and I was just I was I remember crying I, I hadn't cried in 
And I was just I just kept saying to myself, I am so miserable. I am so miserable. And I looked down, I had some steroids, and I thought, if only these were some kind of pill that I could just take and die. But I knew enough from my mom and things. I, I believe that there was something, you know, there you didn't do that, you know. And um, just kept saying over and over, I'm so miserable, I'm so miserable. And it was like one, one thirty in the morning and, and someone knocked at my door. And I thought, well, who's that? So I, I opened the door and here's this freshman. His name was Mike Moore. He was standing there. He's not a very tall guy, maybe five eight, five nine, or something. He's standing there and he's kind of scared. I looked at him like, what? And he said, uh, you're probably going to beat me up. I thought, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> you know, just what is... And he said, i got to talk to you. And although I knew him, I knew he was a nice guy and stuff. I didn't really know him. And um, I said, what do you want to talk to me about? He said, look, God has been dealing with me for two weeks that I need to come over here and talk to you. And I, I've been scared. And I can't take it any longer. I've got to talk to you. And I said, well, what? He goes, I just feel like God wants me to tell you something. And I said, well, then I'm thinking, this is really strange. This guy's coming over with a word from God. I said, oh, okay, well, what? He goes, that you're just miserable and you're going to keep being miserable until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And um, we talked till like 4 or 5 in the morning and it really impacted me. And then I was reading. I, my mom had given me a Bible and I found it and I started reading it. And I came to Psalms 103. It says um, that man's days are like grass as the flower of the field so he flourishes. When the wind passes over him, he is no more and the place acknowledges him no more. And that made me angry because that's exactly what I knew. I remember going to my dad's funeral and he was a very brilliant man. He was a powerful man in his own right. Just many things about him. But at his funeral, people were talking about other things like the weather, sports, uh, what's going on in the company. I mean, just it was like, this man just died. Shouldn't everybody just be quiet or something for a while? Shouldn't they think about him? In that verse where it says the wind passes over and it's no more and the place acknowledges it no more. It's like he never even existed. I got angry and I kind of threw the Bible down on the bed. And then I walked over and I picked it up again. And it said, but the love of the Lord is everlasting on those who fear Him. And that word everlasting, something everlasting. And then I think maybe a couple times somebody visited me or something. And then one day I was at the library, at the undergraduate library at the University of Texas. And we had this kind of, uh, we were competing against oil, other oil companies, supposedly, other students. And we were running off some oil surveys. And one of the, the girl on our team came up to me and she said, I'm going to have a party tomorrow. I think it was tomorrow night, she said. And uh, why don't you come to it? And I had kind of gotten to the point where I didn't, I used to really party and things. And, and I had gotten to the point where I didn't even do that anymore. I would just sit in a bar all by myself and drink. And so I looked at her and I said, no, I'm not coming to your party. And uh, she said, why not? She goes, you never do anything. Why don't you come? Why not? And really, this is what happened. I didn't think about my answer. I didn't, I mean, I didn't design it. Just all of a sudden it came out of my mouth and it shocked me as much as it did anybody else in the room. I said, I'm not going to your party because I'm a Christian now and I'm going to follow Jesus. And I looked at the guys. They all kind of turned around and looked at me because they knew what I was. I, I, I drank, lied, just... And they looked at me. When they looked at me, it's like all of a sudden I realized what I said. And it's like just a light just went... <laughs> I mean, it's just like it wasn't a literal light. No, don't criticize me for that statement. It's just... It's a metaphor. <laughs> it was just like all of a sudden... It was like, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That I believe in Jesus. I, I, I do. I believe. I believe. I'm sitting there in front of these guys. I'm going, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I really do believe in Jesus. And I just walked out 
And then I started walking quicker because I was just like, what has happened to me? I mean, what has happened? I mean, I felt like it's like just new. And I remember getting to the library doors, the outside doors, and I opened them up. And there was a girl coming in who was part, who was in the same dorm. And I didn't know this, but a whole group of people had been praying for me since the, when I first moved into the dorm, like several months prior. Been praying for me. She was one of the girls. When I opened up the door, she goes, Paul, Paul, what's happened to you? And then I got scared. I got real scared. I was like, I don't know. And I just took off running. And I, I walked, ran as fast as I could back, back to the apartment. And I found that guy. And I said, Mike, Mike, I'm really scared. Something happened to me in the library. All I know is I believe in Jesus and I'm new. He said, you look new. <laughs> and so he took me down to the guy who was like the RA who had been leading a Bible study named Mike Martin. And uh, I sat, and all these guys, Mike Martin and Stuart DePena and Mike Moore and all these different guys that had been studying the Bible together and were kind of leaders, you could say, of different like Campus Crusade and things. I sat down and I started telling them everything that happened. I'll never forget one of them goes, you've been born again. <laughs> and I was like, what's that? You know? And um, And then... I uh, here's something. I, I I had the filthiest mouth, and it stopped. It just stopped. But I'll tell you what didn't stop. Lying. And after the joy of that day, I I began to think about I had lied to people, and then. I mean, so many things in my life changed, but then I would be talking and something would just pop out that wasn't true. And before, I could just... It didn't bother me. I almost was... I mean, I was proud of my life. You know, I mean, I could do... I could make anybody believe anything. And something... And I would be so struck down by the Holy Spirit and so ashamed that I would have to go back and say, I lied. I lied. And it went on. You know, it's amazing. Some things, drinking and cussing and everything, just stopped. But other things were like this thing that constantly broke me, constantly broke me. And the Lord then gave me victory over it. But it was, you know, and now it's like one exaggeration. My wife says that I'm, I, I speak in superlatives. She says everything is the greatest to you. Everything is the biggest to you. And that's true. But even in that, sometimes the Lord just gets me. Um, and uh, so th that's why when some of you guys get real fired up for the Lord and, and you see someone else that maybe comes into your circles and yeah, it seems like God's done a work, but in one area of his life, he's really struggling for change. Don't discount him or think he's unconverted. Sometimes the Lord will remove so many things, but other things we just deal with, you know, throughout our life. And then it was so the next day. This the study group that was there got together and they bought me a big old Ryrie study Bible, New American Standard Ryrie study Bible, and I carry that thing to class. I mean, people literally. I mean, I remember my second day as a Christian. I'm walking back through the student mall there, and I hear some a bunch of people are over here, and I go over there looking. There's this guy talking, you know. And I thought, was he preaching? And I read this guy him preaching. And he was teaching on just sharing about why sex is good, marriage is just a, an artificial institution, and promoting just wickedness. And I'll never forget, I, all of a sudden, just something. I just got so... just, I, and, and I just went through the crowd. And I just, you know, just, you're lying. You're a liar. That's not true. You know, so that was the beginning of my <laughs> street preaching. <laughs> my, my ministry was defined. But another thing that was, um, um, when, I, when I was a boy, 14, 15, I would have dreams all the time. Well, not, not all the time, but frequently. I would have dreams of me preaching. And I would, 
I would wake up crying and telling God, um, I'll get saved if you promise me I don't have to preach. And so when I became a Christian, I also knew basically that, that I was going to preach. And I started uh, uh, going out like at the student mall there and handing out tracts and everything. And it was a real change for me because it went from kind of being a cool guy with a really nice car to, you know, people taking their, your tracks, girls, and laughing at you and throwing them back at you. And it was a time of just just killing the flesh, you know, killing it. But um, God has, has been faithful. God's been faithful.